A craze hit the United States in 1896 after Alfred Lincoln Streeter first succeeded in crashing locomotives for show. Although photographs of railroad crashes were rare, wrecks made newspaper headlines all across the country. Streeter knew that railroad crashes interested people, but like any entrepreneur, he was in it for the fame and money. Streeter was born in the Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania region sometime around 1854. In 1882, he was living in Chicago, working as a brakeman for the railroad. He worked up the ladder, becoming a conductor for a variety of railroads. During his railroading days, he had personally witnessed 20 collisions, and each attracted crowds of people. Streeter was a very smart man, and had also worked as an inventor. One of his early patents came in 1886, a brake for a rail car. By 1891, Streeter was back on the East Coast, in New Jersey. There he was the father of a baby boy, Alfred Lincoln Streeter Jr. That same year, Streeter made news in nearby Manhattan, where he married the mother of the baby, May Elizabeth Mayer. Chicago was selected as the site of the 1893 World's Fair, with dedication ceremonies starting in 1892. The actual fair dates were May 1st to October 31st of 1893. Streeter asked fair officials to have railway collisions as one of the attractions of the fair. However, the fair wanted nothing to do with them. Streeter thought the large crowds in the Jackson Fair complex would love his idea. The site was on Lake Michigan and featured green space interspersed with water areas. Many spectacular buildings were erected at the site where people could wander along beautiful paths or go inside to see the international exhibits. One neat feature about the fair was a Ferris wheel on the west side of the grounds. The Ferris wheel was 264 feet high, had 36 cars, each with a capacity of 60 people, and it gave a 20-minute ride. On the opening day of the fair, President Grover Cleveland gave a speech to a huge crowd. A view from the Ferris wheel also showed the big crowds. In all, the Chicago World's Fair attracted 27 million people. After his rejection, Streeter moved to Canton, Ohio, where he was employed as a traveling salesman. However, he was still thinking about his idea to crash locomotives for show. His main challenge was to get the railroads interested. New locomotives were being built all the time. These new engines were usually larger and featured the latest improvements. They could also be produced quickly and in large quantities. Thousands of older locomotives became obsolete and rusted away on sidetracks. Railroads also wanted to make money. In 1895, Streeter found a company interested in his idea right in Canton, Ohio. The Cleveland, Canton, and Southern Railway agreed to host a made-to-order railroad collision on its Waynesburg branch, about two miles southeast of Canton. To fund his idea, Streeter asked the Canton merchants, who would benefit from the crowds, to put up money. The local newspaper said $2,000 was pledged, although only about $900 was actually collected. $900 in today's dollars would be about $33,000. To keep people from freeloading, Streeter wanted to enclose the crash area with a fence. The price of admission was set at 75 cents, which would correspond to about $28 today. The railroad charged 15 cents for the ride to the crash site, or about $5.50 today. The biggest expense was for the two locomotives, which the railroad wanted $2,400 for. That would be about $88,000 today. To beef up interest, one locomotive was named Free Trade, while the other was labeled Protection, two of the prominent political policies of the time. The two engines were exhibited all over the Canton area for people to admire. 
For the crash, each locomotive would pull two flat cars filled with rocks. Large advertisements were made in the local newspapers. On the day of the event, the plan began to unravel. The site was close enough to Canton that people could just walk. They didn't need to pay the railroad to drop them off. The grounds were only partially enclosed, so people could see from the nearby hills and woods. About 3,000 people showed up for the event, but only about 190 actually purchased tickets. Without this revenue, Streeter could not pay the railroad to crash their two locomotives, so the event was canceled. The local newspaper said the event was a huge fizzle. They claimed Streeter should have had sufficient funds to pay all his costs ahead of time. It cost Streeter about $800 of his own money, which would correspond to about $29,000 today. Streeter now believed his concept would work if he could just fix a few details. His next chance came about a year later, on May 30th, 1896, near Lancaster, Ohio. There, the Columbus, Hawking Valley, and Toledo Railway wanted to host a made-to-order collision at its Buckeye Park. Since Buckeye Park wasn't near any towns, people would need to pay the railroad fare, 75 cents for adults, to get to the grounds. 75 cents would be about $28 today. To make it sound like a better deal, no admission was charged. To promote the show, both locomotives were painted like circus cars. One was named the W.H. Fisher, and the other the A.L. Streeter. Fisher was the general passenger and ticket agent at Columbus, Ohio. For this collision, each locomotive would pull three coal cars and a caboose. Large advertisements were again placed in all the local newspapers. Streeter even had a graphic produced to accompany these ads, which featured a locomotive with his name on the side. Buckeye Park was a place where the railroad wanted people to come and enjoy their pavilion, cookhouse, lunch stands, swings, and a lake. Also, to pay a fare to get there. Excursion trains ran from all the various railroads in the area. Streeter advertised that there would be no postponement for the weather, so people could count on the event occurring. He claimed the show would be the most realistic and expensive attraction ever presented. A special track one mile in length was laid to give the crowd the best view. The locomotives would be outfitted with dummy engineers and brakemen to make it look real. At the signal, the throttles of both locomotives would be pulled wide open and the men would step off. Each engine would have a run of about a half a mile to the collision point, attaining a speed of about 45 to 50 miles an hour. On the day of the event, 198 passenger coaches packed with people were brought to Buckeye Park. Thousands of country people drove, walked, or cycled to the park. The fields were blackened for miles with horses and rigs. The crowd was estimated to be about 25,000 people. In addition, many newspaper reporters and artists were in the crowd. Representatives for the Edison Kinetoscope were on hand, as well as several national scientific publications. It was thought that about 100 cameras were on scene. The locomotives were first lined up for pictures and to gather excitement. They then took their places and ran toward each other. The collision occurring within 100 feet of the estimated point at 4.22 p.m. There was a huge crash, a hissing of steam, a brief hush, followed by a mad rush of thousands. When the air cleared and the wreck could be seen, a cheer went up from the crowd. The beautifully decorated engines were high in the air, staring each other in the face. Complete wrecks. The cars were all telescoped together. It could not be determined where one left off and the other began. The wreck was soon overcome by souvenir hunters. Streeter's plan finally had a successful outcome, with satisfied customers. As for the financials, the railroad bore all the expenses and kept the excursion fees. 
If 10,000 adults rode the train to the park, that would give the railroad 7,500, or 275,000 today. For his work, Streeter was paid an unknown commission. The thrilling story was presented to a wide audience, from Watertown, South Dakota, to Indianapolis, to Los Angeles, to Salt Lake City, to Savannah, Georgia, and Austin, Texas. The only negative to the event was one injury, ironically, to an employee of the hosting railroad. He was hit by a flying piece of steel that struck his leg. Following this success, Streeter was back in Chicago, feeling good about his prospects. He formed a company that would give made-to-order railroad collisions, which some newspapers called the Western Railroad Collision Company. This did not last for very long, however, as Streeter moved on to other things by 1899. He went back to his inventor roots, forming the Streeter Brake Shoe Company. One of his inventions for a brake shoe had taken off, and he had obtained a patent on it. This company grew quickly and had 60 employees by the end of 1900. Streeter did not appear to have an interest in any one thing for very long. In 1903, he signed an agreement with the American Brake Shoe and Foundry Company, giving them the exclusive use of his invention. The Streeter Brake Shoes, as shown in this image, were used on electric railways. If you look closely, the brake pads fit snugly to the back of the wheel. Streeter also had his hands on making motor fans in Chicago. By 1906, he was president of another company, the Streeter Journal Bearing Company, for which he had another patent on. The 1906 Chicago Directory said Streeter had an office in the fancy Manadnock block and lived in the Hotel Grace. Then began his downfall, as he was involved with an underage girl, Miss Margaret Burkle. The article claimed Streeter had become a millionaire, but that was probably stretching it a bit. To avoid prosecution, Streeter fled to Toronto, Canada. There, he holed up in a hotel to avoid extradition. After three years, the case was dropped, and Streeter could return to the United States. However, Streeter next went to New York City. There, the John Streeter Company was formed to manufacture Streeter brake shoes and railway equipment. Streeter lived at the luxurious Astor House, so he still had plenty of money. One of the things the John Streeter Company manufactured was called the Streeter Resiliator. In New York City, Streeter also brought suit against the American Brake Shoe and Foundry Company, alleging they had only paid him about $3,000 for using his patent idea. Meanwhile, the American Brake Shoe and Foundry Company, partly using the Streeter Brake Shoe, had made millions of dollars. During this time, Streeter continued to turn out brilliant ideas for railroad equipment, which he secured with patents. By 1916, he was back in Chicago. This time, he made headlines due to his divorce. Streeter claimed the divorce wasn't from his infidelities. It was because he had suffered from strokes. This affliction likely resulted in him checking into the Chicago State Hospital for the Insane, where he was shown on the 1920 census. There, Streeter died on August 31, 1926. Streeter's life was much like the beautiful steam engines he crashed. Times were good in his prime, but in the end, his life ended like a wreck. Stay tuned for the next story, The Other 1896 Made to Order Railroad Collisions. That concludes the video. Make sure to check out my other YouTube videos and my primary website at mnbricks.com.